Molding a group hand cast using Platsil Gel Tin. In today's tutorial, we're going to show how to make a mold of a Hydrocal hand cast. This is a group hand cast uh, similar to one we made in a previous tutorial. And a lot of the uh, people making casts like this are usually making them for uh, multiple people who all want a copy of the hand cast. So the next logical step is to then make a mold of that Hydrocal cast so that everybody can have their own copy, either in uh, resin or another Hydrocal or Hydrostone copy. So that's what we'll be covering in this video, how to prep our hands and then reproduce those using a silicone mold. Now one of the first problems that uh, we'll need to address is all of these little undercuts or little pass-through areas under all of the hands. And uh, since this will be uh, kind of a one-sided mold with gel tin, we'll need to fill in those areas using some water-based clay. Now you could also use oil-based clay, but in this case I'm using uh, water-based clay, some of our white modeling clay. This is a very easy, soft clay to work with, and you can smooth it out out with a little bit of water on your fingertips. Now the only catch with this is since this is a uh, an air drying clay you need to uh, move ahead with your molding process fairly quickly uh, after you do this clay up process. So uh, make sure when you do this step that you're ready to move forward with your mold because if you let it sit like this for too long the uh, hydrocal will start drawing the moisture out of the clay and it'll crack and uh, distort and pull away from that hydrocal cast. So make sure you uh, clay up these areas right before you're ready to make your mold. Now here we've uh, clayed up most of the areas that we need to uh, fill in and we just want to make sure that there's no major undercuts or more importantly no areas where the silicone can actually pass underneath the cast and cause it to lock into our silicone mold. Now this particular cast has uh, dried out for a few days so we want to be careful to release it properly so that our silicone doesn't grab onto that dry plaster or hydrocal surface. Now silicone doesn't really want to bond to hydrocal, but uh, it will get tangled up in the pores of a very dry porous material. So here what we're doing is creating a sealer using some of our mold soap mixed with warm water. Here I'm mixing up about half and half warm water with uh, mold soap to create a sealing solution. That uh, what we'll do is just brush that all over the exposed hydrocal surface. And what that mold so soap does is actually creates a crystallized surface on the uh, hydrocal which prevents that silicone from seeping in to the pores of the hydrocal. And that's an important step. If you've got a plaster piece or hydrocal or even ultracal 30 and uh, it sits for a while and is really dry, microscopically that will actually look like a sponge and uh, you can have a situation where your silicone really wants to grab onto that surface. Now once we put that on and given it time to dry, usually a couple of hours, I like to go back and spray it with a layer of release. Now this is just added protection. You don't have to do this, but a light spray of 2500 spray release will really uh, uh, give you that much more guarantee that your silicone is not going to grab on to that dry hydrocal. And once we've applied our release and let that dry for another hour or so, we're ready to mix up our Platsil Gel Tin. Now for this particular mold we chose Gel Tin as our silicone because Gel Tin is a very soft, stretchy silicone and ideal for pulling around deep undercuts. And Gel Tin, just for the uninitiated, is a translucent formula of silicone. It's just a colorless formula. It's a one-to-one -one mix ratio. And typically it's a pourable silicone. And for this application, we'll need to thicken it to a brushable paste for some of the layers we'll build up. And it thickens easily with the Tin Thix Thickener Additive. And also gel tin is very fast setting uh, because it's a uh, typically used for a lot of special effects applications. This gives a five minute working time and about a 30 minute demold. So it's ideal for a quick brush on mold like we'll be doing here. And then of course it's also very soft with high elongation or high stretch which allows it to pull out of deep undercuts. And that's again ideal for a complicated uh, hand cast like this. Now we'll be building up our mold in about four layers. 
and the first layer we want to be very runny. We're not going to be adding any of the thixotropic additive. So here we'll just be mixing up our silicone one-to-one -one. and just as a side note a gel tin can be mixed one-to-one -one by weight or volume. I personally prefer weight just because it is that much more accurate, that much more precise, especially when you're working in small amounts. Now here we're mixing up about a 400 gram batch. This is about 200 grams of part A and 200 grams of part B. And I'm adding a little bit of red silicone pigment. And the reason for that is since gel tin is normally just a colorless translucent silicone, we want to see some contrast when we put this over a white hydrocal cast. So this will really help us see where we're working, make sure we can see the color a lot better, see uh, that our silicone is properly mixed and spread all over our pattern. And I, I really prefer uh, using silicone pigments a lot for large molds as well because anytime you're working with several people applying silicone, it's really good to be able to see where everybody has been because it's really easy on large molds for everyone to uh, put silicone all in the same place it's easy to get to and not get some of the deeper undercut areas. Now again, this silicone has not been thickened. We have not added any of the tin thicks thickener. So we want that to be very runny. This is what's typically referred to as a print coat that will establish all that detail in the surface of the mold. And again, remember that we only have about a five minute working time. So you want to move fast and deliberately. And if you're new to working with a fast silicone like this, it's a good idea to set your smartphone timer to about four minutes or a little bit under the working time and that way when it goes off you know that you uh, have about 30 or 45 seconds left of working time. But real important to keep track of that because one of the saddest things is to get to the end of the working time and then realize you've got a bunch of unused silicone still sitting in the bucket. So make sure you keep track of that and uh, don't get too painterly with it. Make sure you uh, move deliberately and move across the whole piece getting that silicone evenly spread out. And gravity will do a lot of the work for you with this layer because since uh, we haven't uh, added any thickener to it, the uh, silicone is naturally going to move downhill and start creating a puddle around the base. But once you've got your piece totally covered, it's a good idea to create a nice flange out from the piece. We'll, you'll see the importance of that later on when we go to demold our part. But we want a nice wide two to three inch flange outside of the piece. And that just makes it much easier to handle the uh, mold later on when you go to demold your cast parts. Now the working time on gel tin is about five minutes, but it'll hit a point where it's tacky and ready to accept more silicone in about 10 to 15 minutes at room temperature. So now we've hit a point where when you can touch that and pull away your finger without removing silicone, that's a good indicator that you're ready to apply the next layer. So here we're doubling up our batch. We're doing about 400 grams of A and 400 grams of B. And uh, much like our first coat, we're adding some silicone pigment again. This time we're using some white just for contrast. And what that will do again is help us see where our new silicone layer is being put on over that red layer. So it just makes our progress that much easier to track and be able to see that we've covered every part of the uh, piece. Now as I mentioned on the first layer we did that with no thickener and that gave us a, a silicone that is what's called Newtonian flow where you brush it on and everything just wants to seep to the lowest level and create a big puddle. But it can't because it kicks before that, that time period and solidifies. Now with our next coat we want to have a little bit more control over building up that thickness. We've got our print coat in place, so now we need to back that up with a thicker layer of silicone. And to do that, we've added some of the tin thick silicone thickener. And what this does, this liquid thickener additive, when you put that in, it reacts with that base silicone and creates more of a gel consistency or more of a paste consistency. And uh, depending on how much of that tin thicks you add, controls how thick that gets. And if you put uh, the more you add, the thicker it gets and all the way up to the point where it behaves almost like frosting. And we want this to be a fairly thick consistency. So we've added probably about a half a gram to this batch. And once you see that thickener reacting and it starts to hit that kind of gel consistency, you're ready to start spreading that on your piece. And you'll notice it'll thicken up more and more throughout the working time. 
And again, at this stage, if you're new to working with gel tin or any other fast setting silicone that we have in that Platseal gel series, it's a good idea to set your smartphone timer. I can't stress that enough. One of the things you want to really watch out for is not getting preoccupied with one area of the piece and letting that silicone set up. So make sure you move deliberately about your piece and keep track of your working time and make sure you get all that silicone out of the mixing cup before that silicone starts to kick. Now in addition to applying this thickened silicone with a brush, you can also use a stir stick or a palette knife or popsicle stick to help fill in some of these undercut areas. Again, when it starts to get more to that uh, pasty consistency, you can go in with either a brush or a trowel and start filling up some of those undercuts. And it's not terribly critical at this point because we're going to build up two more layers of silicone, but it's always a good idea to really get into those undercut areas and start filling those uh, areas under the fingertips and uh, any overhanging areas that might not have good coverage of silicone from that first layer. And again, once our working time uh, runs out on this, it's going to start to get a little bit grabby. And when the silicone starts to get a little bit uh, grabby and pulling on itself and getting kind of stringy and gummy, that's a good indicator that uh, we've hit the end of our working time. Now, it's important to remember that all of our working times and demold times are at room temperature. If you're working in a warmer environment, it's going to be much faster. Now, one way to check your work, again, is to use your fingernail and tap on that edge. And when you could do that without any silicone coming off on your fingertip, that's a good indicator that you're ready for the next layer of silicone. Now, if you do your mixing right, your bucket should clean out for reuse just like that. So now we're ready for our third layer of silicone. And uh, again, we're, we're doing a larger batch this time. And remember that all these numbers we're giving out are approximate. That 200 gram uh, to 200 gram first batch or the 400 gram to 400 gram uh, second batch, all of that needs to be adjusted for the size of your project. So if you're making a mold much smaller than this, work in smaller batches. Obviously, a bigger mold would require bigger mat batches. So be aware of that, that obviously all of those amounts will uh, be adjusted for the size piece you're working on. Now again, just like our previous uh, batch, we're mixing this up with some silicone pigment. This time we're going back to red so we can see that contrast again. And then we're also adding again about a half a gram of silicone thickener, or the tin thick thickener. And once we get that stirred up really good and we don't have any little striations or anything like that, we're ready to start applying that to our piece. And again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to a cheap uh, throwaway brush, you can also use a popsicle stick or a uh, palette knife or even a stir stick. Anything like that to help you trowel that silicone into some of those deep undercut areas. This is going to be our last thickened batch, so we really want to make sure on this layer we get all those undercuts completely filled and simplify that form so that later on our plaster banded shell will easily pull off the top of our piece. So remember that as you build this up, you want that form to be streamlined and simplified so that later on that shell will come off. This is one of those processes, if you're new to brush on molds, it's a good idea to watch several of our videos that cover that process so you can get a good idea as to how to build those shells so that you don't wind up with undercuts in your rubber mold that still grab onto that hard shell that you'll build later. Now, one of the ways you can check your work and make sure that you're not going to have any uh, negative draft or undercuts is what I'm doing here with that popsicle stick, where I work that as an at an angle uh, to create that beveled edge. So all around the exterior margin of the piece, we have a nice beveled edge that's not going to grab onto our plaster banded shell. And uh, remember that uh, you could also uh, make a uh, a plastic shell using thickened plastic brushed over the top. There's a, a number of different ways you can go about this. A plaster banded shell is a nice expedient way to get a mold like this done and uh, still creates a good usable mold that uh, will last years in your mold library. And now we're finishing up uh, uh, filling in those undercuts. And you notice that we have a very simplified form where uh, all those areas where the fingers were and around the wrist where we had deep undercuts have all been filled in. We have a nice, simplified, uh, streamlined form uh, that won't create any undercut areas when we go to build our shell. 
So again, we're letting this sit for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes and we do our little fingertip test and now we're ready for our final layer of silicone. Now much like our print coat, this layer will be uh, with no thickener added to it. We're just going back to the white pigment for this layer. So again, we can see exactly where we're putting it. But uh, unlike the print coat, we're not trying to uh, establish any detail on the surface of the mold. In this case, we just want to, again, simplify the form. And this, this helps the outside of the mold just smooth everything out and make sure we don't have any little uh, areas that might grab onto our shell. So more of just a little bit of housekeeping than anything else. This is a very small batch of silicone that we're just brushing all over the piece just to smooth everything out. And uh, once we've done that, and uh, coated the entire surface of the piece and let that sit. Uh, we're going to let that completely set up because since we're not adding any more silicone to this, we're going to let this whole configuration sit for about an hour. And uh, once we've let everything sit for about an hour, the silicone will be at full strength and we can go back and cut off that surrounding edge and uh, cut that back a little bit to give us a nice clean edge on the uh, outside of our mold. And we're doing that just using a regular uh, razor knife. You can use an X-Acto for this, but the important thing here is just cut back that edge so you have a nice precise edge for uh, the shell to grab onto. And the other thing here we're doing is we need a registration point. Since overall, this is a mold that doesn't really, uh, it looks the same or similar from all sides, we need to cut a key into one of the edges so that we can establish how it fits in that shell later on. And basically by creating that little V-shaped notch, when we build our bandage shell or plastic shell over the top, it'll uh, register at that point and we'll know exactly how that uh, rubber mold will sit in that hard shell or mother mold. Now, we've covered this in a lot of videos before, so if you're new to our, uh, our tutorials, I would recommend going through and looking at uh, some of the links I'll put in the video description. We'll actually link to a whole page of life casting videos as well as some of the brush on mold videos so you can see this process in much more detail on our website. So be sure to check out the uh, links below because in that uh, page that I'll provide a link to on uh, plaster bandages, you'll see uh, much more tips on uh, bandage use and just uh, general life casting rules. Uh, overall, we'll be doing a repeat of a lot of the shells we've done in previous videos, which is basically a plaster bandage shell where we've built that up about uh, three layers thick uh, in bandages all over the piece and then overlapped each bandage about halfway so we wind up with a shell that's roughly about six layers thick of plaster bandages. And you notice there one of the key things when I'm making a shell like this is I fold those edges over so we don't have any frayed edges on the uh, outside edge of the life cast. And then we're going to make sure that uh, we have an edge that goes in that key so that will all register later on when we put this mold back together. Now one of the key points when you're working with any kind of plaster or gypsum material, make sure you have a bucket of water. In this case we're using our bandage water to clean my hands here because uh, any of that going down your drain will ruin your plumbing. So make sure you have a bucket of water for cleaning your hands. And now ready to demold our plaster bandage shell and peel off our finished uh, silicone mold off of our hands. Now. If you did your job of filling undercuts with silicone, this should demold fairly easily. Uh, this is about two or three hours later. I let this sit for a good while so it would have a nice strong shell. And now that we've got that shell, we just uh, go back in, grab an edge, and carefully peel up that silicone jacket off of our HydroCal original. And we want to take care here to uh, carefully pull that out from under the fingertips. That's the one area I mainly wanted to preserve the, uh, uh, the cast as well as I could and not risk breaking any fingertips or anything like that because gel tin is a really strong silicone. So you're not really concerned about that, that ripping as much as just protecting that cast underneath uh, just in case we want to do something else with that original. And once we've peeled all of that off, we're ready to take that silicone jacket 
and clean it out and seat it back into our plaster bandage mold. Now you'll notice we have some clay residue, some of that water-based clay residue, and the nice thing with a mold like this, it's very easy to clean and all of that residue can just be washed right out. So we can take that over to a bucket of clean warm water and wash out any excess. And again, we seat that back into our shell and then we'll be ready for casting. Now for this tutorial, I wanted to just give a quick overview of the casting process because we've already run way over time on what uh, the average attention span is on YouTube. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the casting process. One of the reasons we uh, made the mold the way we did, where I used the clay to... Uh, fill in those undercuts and simplify that form down at the base is so I'd have a nice wide bowl shaped mold later on that I can get in there and brush thickened resin into. And also this will help if we make a cold cast bronze piece later on where we can actually take that uh, uh, resin and thickened with bronze powder and brush it directly into that mold. And we have a nice access to all of the areas of that mold and in this case, we just did a very simple uh, brush up mold, uh, brush up cast using some fast setting resin. This is some of the uh, TC800 casting resin, and we just thickened that up with some polyfiber and brushed it up to create our cast. And now we have our finished resin cast ready for cleanup. Just a little bit of work with the Dremel tool and some sandpaper, and we'll be ready to paint this and finish it to look like uh, bronze or antique copper. And there you have the process of making a gel tin mold of a group hand cast. And of course, as usual, you can find all of the supplies, all of the life casting supplies, as well as mold making supplies on our website at brickintheyard.com. And I'll put links to all of the products we used as well as some links to some of the critical video pages on our website. So be sure to check that out in the video description and also check out our Instagram page. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash biddymoldsupply for all kinds of pictures of works in progress and product tips. So check us out and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And again, thanks for watching.